Thank you also for coming out to the second night of our weekend-long retrospective of films by Larry Clark. A filmmaker and professor of film at San Francisco State University, Clark was born in Ohio and attended Miami University in Oxford, where he, quote, raised a lot of hell as the president of the Black Student Union. In 1970, he drove his Volkswagen bug across Route 66 to Los Angeles, where he enrolled in uh, film school at UCLA. There, he became a central member of a group of filmmakers, uh, innovative black filmmakers, including Charles Burnett, Haile Garima, and Julie Dash, who came to be known collectively as the LA Rebellion. Round of applause. Tonight, we look at films that Clark contributed to uh, while at UCLA, beginning with Hourglass, directed by Haile Garima, with uh, Clark as cinematographer, followed by The Horse from 1973, directed by Charles Burnett, with Clark at work behind the lens as assistant camera person and also in front, performing alongside Gordon Houston and Maury Wright. Following those two films, we will uh, present uh, Clark's own long-form short as writer-director, as above, so below. We would be happy to present these films on any occasion, but we're especially honored to have Larry Clark with us here in person. Larry will join me on, oh yeah, Larry. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna have, yeah, Larry, come on up and say a few words and we'll start the show. Hello, I'm glad to see everyone here. I, I hope you enjoy the films. Uh, these were some of the first works of, of, of our film. So of course they are uh, as flawed as a first work can be and as magical <laughs> as a first work, first work can be. Uh, Haile Grima was in the uh, theater department. He was an actor, a very good actor. And uh, he decided to transfer into the uh, film department. I met him um, before he, he transferred, the day before he transferred. And uh, uh, I told him about the film department, and I gave him some film, and the rest is history. With Charles Burnett, Charles uh, was really a hard worker, and I was very happy to work with him on uh, uh, The Horse. Uh, and with As Above, So Below, had a film workshop uh, uh, called Pazla. Uh, uh, was at a place called Pazla, Performing Arts Society of Los Angeles, that uh, was the brain, uh, that was uh, the direct artistic director was Van Tyl Whitfield. And I set up a film workshop there to train uh, uh, young people how to make film. I was at UCLA, and whatever I learned one day, I would go into the community and <laughs> teach the next day with UCLA's equipment. <laughs> and uh, uh, so some really good people came through that department, through our, through our workshop. One was Roderick Young, who was the DP on Passing Through, along with George Geddes, and also the DP uh, on uh, As Above, So Below. As Above, So Below was the first film that he shot. Then he went on to shoot uh, Watt Stacks, uh, and he also was a cameraman on uh, the Muhammad Ali George Foreman uh, fight in Zaire uh, when we were kings. So, but he started out in the film workshop, and this was his first uh, uh, work as a DP. And we had a lot of fun doing it. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the the the, the, the films. Um, uh, they're first films, but uh, you can kind of see where we started. Larry, thanks so much for joining us again here tonight. Um, so it's always amazing for me to go through the credits of the El Rebellion films and find how many films each of you, I mean, you all worked on each other's films. Um, Julie Dash was credited as a, on sound for Passing Through last night. Charles Burnett was a camera operator on Passing Through. You obviously shot Hourglass and you were a camera operator and the horse in, in actually on screen. How did that kind of collaboration come about? I mean, I'm sure it was part of just being a student at UCLA, but was it particular? Was there something particularly meaningful to work on each other's films at that period of time for you? Um, you know, I didn't think about it at the time. It was just sort of a, 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 a organic thing that happened. You know, it wasn't forced or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the thing with, as I mentioned before, with students is that 
uh, students aren't reliable to work on a film from beginning to end because they have their own work to do, but they will help when they can, you know. Uh, so uh, that's why I developed uh, 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 my film workshop at uh, uh, Pazla on 87 Vermont where I really had a, a dedicated crew and then students, uh, friends, and they would, would help. We would always help each other when we could, you know. And so uh, it worked out really well, yeah. Did that collaboration extend sort of into discussing, I mean, like Hourglass and the horse are clearly very strong, like auteurist, you know, visions, um, although, you know, different visions. I mean, as above, so below, very strong, you know, obviously personal vision. When you're working on each other's films, you know, in that way, did you talk about, like, did, was there a lot of back and forth about, hey, why are you doing this or why are we doing this? or? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, <Okay. laughs> there was a place on North Campus uh, called the Gypsy Wagon, okay. and and I'm sure no one here knows anything about the Gypsy Wagon, but they sold hamburgers and stuff like that, and there was a place outside to sit, and so there were these tables, and we would almost every day, every other day, we would get the, the group of us would sit around this table and discuss films. Not necessarily our films, but all kinds of films, like Cinema Novo films and Italian Neorealism, uh, um, Japanese films, African films. And we would <laughs> get into these raging arguments where we'd be shouting and screaming at each other. You would think we were arguing over money or something like that. <laughs> but it was about a film that we saw, and we were trying to take it apart and you know, was, uh, the, the, the the French call it debat. <laughs> you know, this is a debat, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. debate. Yeah. And we were really debating, you know. And so we were going, we, we were learning a lot from just challenging each other, you know. And there were a couple of people outside of the department that sort of uh, got involved to Desmond Ntangela Masilela. He's from South Africa. For a long time, I thought he was in the film department, but he was actually in uh, African studies, and he was enamored with film. And, and, and so it was a group of us that were, and Julie was in there too, and, and we would just discuss films, you know. Uh, and occasionally we would discuss each other's film, you know, but not in detail, you know, because uh, um, we all had our own personal vision, you know, and we respected each other's vision, you know. Uh, the outlier was our great friend Jamal Fanaka, who we have tremendous respect for. Uh, but, but he he was very different from the rest of us, you know. And uh, uh, but I, I you know I loved Jamal Fanaka, but he, he didn't participate in these these discussions at all. Uh, he used to laugh at us and say, "I'm not like you revolutionaries. I'm going to Hollywood," you know. <laughs> and he made three feature films as a student only person in film history to make three feature films as a student and all of them made money and he even laughed at us harder when he drove to school one day in a powder blue rolls royce <laughs> so, but uh, yeah so it was it was it was all in good fun you know uh, and uh, uh, so you know charles talked about the horse but we didn't know much about it you know mm -hmm. Julie talked about Daughters of the Dust a long time before she made it, you know. Mm -hmm. She had this idea and she was researching uh, the Georgia Sea Islands and the Gullah people and, and so she talked about talked about that film for a long time before she actually made it. Mm -hmm. And likewise with Charles, he uh, a killer of sheep, he, he talked about that film and uh, he was gonna organize his whole community to work on this film. And I said, well, Charles, when are you going to start? He said, well, i got to wait until Gene gets out of jail. I said, well, I thought Gene must be this fabulous actor, you know. I said, well, can you recast it with someone else? He said, well, no, no, because uh, Gene has to be in it. I said, well, why? He said, because he's a member of the community. Mm -hmm. And since, uh, and so he, everybody expects him to be in it, you know. So finally Gene got out of jail and Charles started his film. And if you ever saw Killer Sheep, Gene has this small role in it. He said, He's sitting in a car with a, with a Bracy, a guy named Bracy, and uh, they're talking. And then you think there's a windshield in, in in the car, but then he reaches through the windshield and gets a can of beer off the off off, off the, the hood. And that's his big moment. <laughs> and but Charles, but Charles, you know, waited for him because. Of, so we talked about 
that, you know, and uh, we all had our own way of doing things, you know, and, and actually looking back on it, we really kind of respected what each other was doing and didn't get in the way of each other, you know, in terms of offering negative criticism uh, of, of a project that was going to start, you know, yeah. So you were um, working in still photography um, before you got to film school, and you had mentioned earlier that your your plan was to become a cinematographer, and, yeah. and you were a cinematographer on our hourglass and camera operator on the horse. When did you when did you have that the, the, make the decision, or how did you come? What was the process where you went from okay, writing and directing? I'm gonna I'm, that's what I want to do now. When did you sort of shift your focus to that? Uh, it was. There were two things that, that happened. Uh, one, uh, I noticed that uh, it was hard for uh, people to trust uh, me in terms of shooting their films. A couple people did, uh, Marie Kodani, she did a couple short films and I shot her film and then shot this. And so that kind of irked me a bit. But what, what it really was is that the first film that we did at, at, at Pazla, the person who directed it didn't finish it. Mm. And uh, he sort of realized that film was not for him. He wanted to pursue a different course, and you have to respect that, you know. Right. Um, and so I had to tell Van Whitfield, who was the, the artistic director of Pazla, and uh, also the person who put, uh, I think he, he gave us $900 to do that film. I had to tell him that uh, the film was a bust, you know, and that was a hard conversation for me to, to begin to have with him, and he listened patiently, and, and finally when I told him it, it wasn't going to happen, he sort of laughed, and he said, I figured that was going to happen, so now you have to try again, and I'll give you uh, $1,300 to do this next film. And I thought, there's no way I can let this film fail, right. you know, uh, because he had put so much trust in us, and that was not common in those days, you know, right. to put that uh, any amount of money into a film. And uh, for African-American, especially a, a, a cultural institution like that. And so I decided I would direct the film because I knew if I directed it, I was going to finish it because I didn't want to have that same conversation. With, I didn't want to disappoint Van again. And so it was summer, I think it was August, and I ran out of money. And so I decided that I was going to do it the hard way. I was going to fast. And while I wrote the screenplay for As Above So Little, so I fasted for 13 days. <laughs> yeah, the first three days were the toughest. <laughs> if anybody ever fast, you know, at the beginning, all you can think about is food, you know. Right. And then all of a sudden it sort of kicked in. And uh, and that the, the, the film came about because I was uh, um, in the lobby of uh, Melness Hall and a Japanese-American a uh, friend of mine who was also in the film department, uh, he said, Larry, you got to see this. And what it was, it was a, uh, a report that was being submitted to the House and american Activity Committee, basically what to do with Negroes. Mm -hmm. And the, so the, everything that comes over the radio comes from that, that proposal that was put forth to the House and american Activities Committee, every line of it. I, I wrote none of that. And fortunately, cooler heads prevailed, and the proposal was shelved. You know, uh, <clears throat> and um, um, so uh, uh, I, I, I wrote the screenplay, and then uh, um, um, Van gave us uh, one thousand three hundred dollars, and that's what I made this film for. I, I mean, I definitely want to talk about all the different layers of as above, so below. But I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about so. The way the film school was set up at UCLA, and it may still be the same, is when you entered the film school, when you started, you did what was called a Project One film. And and that was, they just gave you a camera, an eight millimeter camera, and just yeah. no classes yet, just go ahead and make something. And that's what Hourglass was, Haile Grima's Project One film. Right. Then after the Project One film, you do a Project Two film, which my understanding was it's supposed to be like about a 10 minute short. Without sound. Yeah, without sound. Without, As, without sync sound. Right. But yeah. as above, so below was your project two film. <laughs> yeah, and so <laughs> quite a bit longer than ten minutes, and definitely with sound. What, what did they say when you turned it in? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing they could say because okay, it was right. beyond what they had imagined. Right. You know, a film student could do. You right. know, uh, it, it was. You know, it was. Our whole thing was they mystify film. All of us, Charles, 
highly all of us we talk about the domestication of the process you know right. um because film historically had been mystified for example in the very beginning during it during the the, the the before there was sound um the uh camera when the camera ran out of uh film the the camera people would excuse everybody from the set because because it was too dangerous for them to be there partly because it was nitrate film right. but partly because they wanted to take a break you know and uh uh and, and so that sort of the, the process of film from the very beginning was very much mystified, you know, uh, and, 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 and also that's a great way to keep your job, you know, because so that, you know, the, the idea that anybody can make a film, I mean, then you lose your job, you know, or can be a camera operator. So a whole, my whole idea was to demystify the, the process. So if I learned something in class, by the end of the week, I was taking that information back to the, to the community, along with UCLA's equipment, which they didn't know about, and teaching people in the film workshop. And Roderick Young was one of those people, and he caught on really fast. He was really just talented. And Michael Clark, and uh, in fact, Julie Dash was in the film workshop. Right. Uh, before she was in my workshop, she was in a, a workshop in New York, a studio museum in Harlem had a film workshop, and I think she was in that. And so that's that's where I met Julie when she came down to the film workshop, and uh, uh, um, and so the the idea was uh, to demystify the process, and uh, 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 we ended up with a film that Van liked. And he actually, uh, before this film was completed, Van got a a new job at the National Endowment for the Arts on uh, in public a new division called Public Arts, and he was sending, funding a lot of public art. Uh, in the com different communities all over the country. So when I finished my, this film, he actually showed it at the National Endowment for for the the, the uh, arts, and he says, "See, you know, the young people need money to do art. Otherwise, this was might this is what might happen." <laughs> so he used so, so he used my film sort as leverage to get more money for other people doing more sensible art than me. <laughs> well, I mean. One of the questions that I had with that is some, somewhat related to that, I, I think, is um, Horace Tapscott's score yeah. in the film. It, it, I mean, it functions in some in some ways like a like a, you know like a typical film score. It underscores the emotions and, and the meaning of the film. But in other ways, it's it's present as its own object in a way. It it, it yeah. demands its own attention. Yeah. And it also seems to run to play a counterpoint to the HUAC testimony that runs across, which also sort yeah. of interrupts the storyline. Yeah. And there seems to be, it's not a dialogue, it's definitely, but it's more of like a conflict between the two. Yeah. Could, and, and Horace, and so there's there does seem to be like two, like multiple different ways of fighting back liberation. There's the armed struggle, but there's also, I mean, there's also Horace Tapscott, the creative struggle, the creative the, the, yeah. the liber, that, that form of liberation. Can you talk about... Your work with Horace, and did you talk with him about how you wanted the score to work, or he said, "This is how the, I want the score to work." What was that conversation well, like? Well, first, like the creative struggle, yeah. it was really important. I remember the first time we opened up a, a, a camera case, and we looked at it, and and, and the black student was standing next to me, saying, "This is a gun. <laughs> it's a weapon," which it, it is, you know. But what was your question again? Well, I threw a bunch in there. Um, I mean, the first one is that that let's go back to that that oh Horace, the back, okay. yeah, Horace, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So with with as above, so below was really a learning experience, and that's one reason why I was I, I I took it as a challenge because you don't get the opportunity uh, uh, if you don't have money uh, to practice in film and music and art. You get a chance to practice. Because you can do it pretty much by yourself with a small group of people. With film, it's, it's expensive, and you just don't get that opportunity. So I wasn't going to waste it on a ten-minute film without sound that I knew I could do in my sleep. You know, so it was it was a learning experience, uh, and also we were at the workshop, and that's what it was. And so the same with Horace, it was a learning experience. You know, he had he had never scored a a film before, and so. Uh, uh, in some places it works really well, in some places it doesn't work as well as it should be, just like we were all making mistakes on this film. And and that's the way you learn. You learn, you know, right. from your mistakes, you know. And uh, and also from the things you do right, but especially from your mistakes. So um, it was a learning experience, mm -hmm. yeah. 
But I mean, I, I think the film, I think his score functions like as a, as a very significant point of meaning throughout the whole film. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because we talk about you're in film school, you're learning, you're passing that knowledge on. But we also, I mean, you and I talked a little bit earlier, and, and but also about the LA Rebellion filmmakers in general. Part of what you had to do when you got to film school was unlearn, unlearn all the yeah. movies you'd seen, yeah. unlearn all the ways that African Americans have been represented, and try and find new ways of of representing your own voice and your own vision. Absolutely, and that's one reason why we ignore most. Of, we really ignored Hollywood altogether. It wasn't like we were anti Hollywood. We just never considered it, mm -hmm. and we were fortunate enough that. Uh, Alice L. Taylor, who was the, the only black instructor in the department, and that's a long story how he got there because the department really didn't want him. And I think the first year of his contract, uh, his pay was paid for by uh, Mufundi Cultural Center in Watts. But he was the first person to have a class called African, Asian, Latin American Cinema. Later, some places it was taught as third world cinema. Uh, and so he introduced uh, us early on to, like I said before, the Cinema Novo in Brazil, Globo Roja, and mm -hmm. Nelson Piero dos Santos, and the Cuban films, you know, uh, Lucia, Memories Under the Development, um, uh, the films of uh, Santiago Alvarez, um, um, the seven, his film 79 Springtimes, The Ho Chi Minh, and uh, the story of the battle, and and then also he introduced us to Japanese film, Japanese uh, films like the, the films of Akira Kurosawa and Mizoguchi, and mm -hmm. and so that is really, and also in, in uh, not in his class, but we became aware of uh, Italian realism, uh, and so that was kind of like what fed us, mm -hmm. you know. That's what inspired us, you know, uh, because. Um, the mode of production in most of those films were similar to ours, even in the Japanese films, because those films, the, 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 they were made after World War II, uh, and the, 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 the motion picture industry had been destroyed during the war, and same as in, in Italy, uh, they didn't have, have, have hardly two boards to nail together, and they had to figure out how to make films, and so you get the bicycle thief, you know. Yeah. Uh, and in the African cinema, likewise, you know. So you learn how to, uh, make your limitations work for you rather than against you. You know, you don't worry about what you have. You worry about what you, what, not what you, you don't worry about what you don't have. You know, you just work with what you have, and you find out that the limitations can can actually make you stronger. I have a couple more questions, and I'll turn it over to the audience. Um, we'll have microphones on either side, so just raise your hand, and when I point you, someone will bring a mic, and you can ask a question. Um, so, a couple more questions before we turn it over. Color, obviously, we see it in the paintings, um, you know, uh, on screen um, beforehand. But in the films, you have very bold colors, very striking compositions um, in passing through. But also, I mean, very clearly here in As Above, So Below, the screen goes red, you know, all at once. Um, the uh, the room where uh, Jida Hadi's having the conversation and the bold red, you know, paint. But then there's also the church sequences where the it's kind of a bluish tint over those sequences. Can you talk a bit about how color functions in As Above, So Below? Okay. Uh, some of it was just very practical. Uh, the, the red leader, uh, initially I was gonna have black leader run there. I thought it'd be more dramatic. But I changed my mind because I figured back then in the 70s, uh, films shown in the community, if that screen went black, people would turn around thinking there's something wrong with the projector. <laughs> so I decided that black leader was not a good idea, so I decided put red there so it was clear that the projection was okay you know so that was just purely functional you know it wasn't a it wasn't a creative decision it was just uh keeping in mind that if i if i had if i put black leader there then you know the people would think there was something wrong with projection mm -hmm. uh the red room uh, you learn by your mistakes the red room is striking but also, red is not great for uh, African Americans, especially. It depends on what, uh, how dark or how light you are. The darker you are, uh, red. If if you stand close to a red background, and it can bleed into your face, you know. Uh, likewise, that's just a challenge of of, of skin tone, uh, and also uh, 
Uh, for example, if you're white, uh, there's such a thing as they call it Caucasian beige. And, and it's a certain beige, and, and they, they don't like to use it because if you're white, you kind of blend into the background, you know. So, so you have to be aware of that because basically you're trying to make people look good. You know, it's like basic photography, you know. And so there's some do's and don'ts. And if you know that there's a problem and you decide to do it, then you, you figure out how to do it. And so I just kept them away from the walls, you know. And I just wanted that dramatic punch and also... Uh, um, um, it, it, it read was kind of like a political statement, you know. If you if if you were back then, if you were political worthy, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, the idea was that you were communist inspired, you know. Right. So it was read, you know, yeah. So we talked a lot about your work behind the camera. I want to talk a little bit about your work in front of the camera and the horse. Um, how did that? How did it come about that you you ended up on camera? How did you feel about being uh, a performer? Uh, Charlie twisted my arm. <laughs> I, 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 I was in children's, my father signed me up at children's theater when I was five years old. And I was very shy and I hated it, you know. I, I mean, I just didn't like being on stage, you know. And, and my big performance was in The Emperor Doesn't Have Clothes or something like that. And, and, and they, they, they cast me as a little guard that my line was, I was supposed to come to the door at the right time and say, His Majesty the King. Me and, me and another kid, you know, and we totally forgot a play was going on. We were backstage having a good time and we realized a play was happening. We didn't know where they were. We were running toward the door. We tripped and fell through the door at the right time. <laughs> and, so, and so that was the end of my acting career at the age of five. <laughs> and so we went to shoot uh, the horse and the actor... Oh, was a really good actor too. Uh, and had an incredible face. It was just a tragedy that he bailed on on Charles at the last minute. We went to pick him up, and he just bailed. He just didn't want to do it, you know. And so I was assistant cameraman, and so Charles said, "Well, you know, uh, you have to play Ray." I said, I "Say, well, Charles, I really don't." He said, "Look, there's nobody else here." So I'm thinking, "Okay, I'll I'll be in the horse, and nobody will ever see this film," you know. <laughs> So I I, I uh, did the, the the part you know, uh, um, and uh, uh, and that's that. <laughs> well, there's a story about Orson Welles in the Third Man, and someone asked him why he took that role since he not doesn't even show up in the film until like halfway through, and he's yeah. like, yeah, but everybody's talking about that character for the first half of the film. It's a little bit like the horse; they're waiting yeah. for you to show up. Yeah, there's no small roles. No. Um. So, any questions from the audience? Just raise your hand, and we'll have a mic come down. Any questions from the audience? Right down here. We'll bring a, we'll bring a mic down to you. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for uh, coming to speak with us. Uh, one thing that I kind of found very striking about both this film and uh, Passing Through, and it's sort of true about a lot of the LA Rebellion films, is the very different way you guys shoot Los Angeles. Um, I'm kind of wondering how conscious uh, you were of shooting a city that has been interpreted through a Hollywood lens throughout most of its on-screen history. Right, uh, and, and I was very much aware of that uh, in, in both films. And I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, all right? And so uh, <laughs> and I was talking to a friend of mine who's also from Cleveland, Ohio, and he was saying, you know, whenever I think about home, think about Cleveland, I always see it in black and white. You know, even if I dream about Cleveland, I see it in black and white. I said, me too, you know. So, but Cleveland has a special look. Well, every city in the country has a different look from L.A. With L.A., you kind of just see to the horizon. There's nothing back there. And so I wanted to, uh, to, to, have, to have things, have your eyes stop on something. So I chose the locations on passing through and as a both bo so, so below carefully because I, I didn't want the eye to go off to the horizon. You know, I wanted it to stop. So um, both films have a, they don't classically look like L.A., you know. Uh, I mean, you know it's L.A. because, some, you know, because it's L.A. Rebellion and all that, but um, I tried to uh, make the film look like it was any place but L.A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was very much aware of that. That's a good, thank you. Another question from the audience? Raise your hand, we'll bring a mic to you. 
I've got one more while we're waiting. So both passing through and as above, so below, you make like very extensive and I think really powerful use of archival documentary footage. Um, what was it, what was your process of for tracking this footage down and, and the research that went into finding the footage you needed? Well, there were certain key uh, uh, companies, the Grimberg Film Library in New York, for example. Mm -hmm. um, they had cataloged uh, amazing. They had things you could basically look up what you wanted in a catalog, you know. Uh, so um, I wanted uh, 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 the Dominican Republic foot. Well, that same. I have a friend, a childhood friend, who um, joined the military before Vietnam, and while he was in the military, uh, they were assigned to go to the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. and he refused to go because he, he said that. Uh, they said it was just a police in action. He said, no, that we're going to get involved. So he refused to go. And his company went, and they made it really difficult on uh, on his base, so he decided he would join his base. Mm -hmm. And so that that, so those sto that story about the Dominican Republic is something that was told to me by a childhood friend, and it, what he saw in the Dominican Republic, how he said uh, um, they shot up a Volkswagen and, and, and decapitated a guy and just skipped his head down the street for, for kicks, you know. And then another friend who was uh, in Vietnam told me about the fragging thing. And um, so uh, I just basically, for Dominican Republic, just looked up Dominican Republic the year, and there was some footage of, uh, of, of our involvement. Not a lot, but enough just to make that. that. And then the Vietnam, Vietnam um, footage was the same thing. I got that from, I think, uh, a company here in Los Angeles that sold. Uh, stock footage, so you could buy that stock footage relatively cheap for uh, non-commercial uh, films. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just basically I bought it. One more question from the audience. All right, here in the aisle. Hello, hi. Thank you so much for being here and ch for sharing your films. Uh, my question was regarding the diner scene. Uh, with the waitress and uh, her praising Jesus and later on in the church. Mm -hmm. Those scenes seemed very uh, satirical. And given your relationship with religion, I wanted to know if you could talk about that a little bit more. Well, the, the church scene, uh, this is another scene that I didn't write any of that. Uh, I turned on the radio. Was a, uh, they used to have these radio programs with these services. Put a mic by the radio, recorded it, transcribed it, and, and that went into the film. So I didn't write any of that dialogue. <laughs> that actually came from a church service, you know. Um, and uh, so, uh, but also with uh, being in the restaurant, the church has been uh, central to liberation of, 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 of African Americans all the way back to slavery, as you probably know that a lot of slave rebellions and escapes were planned in the church. And they had uh, language that they would use. There was uh, songs that they would sing. There was excerpts from the Bible that would say, we're going to leave on this day, and such and such a person, and we're going to go on the Underground Railroad. You know, So the church uh, was, was very important uh, for escaping slavery. and, and uh, and likewise, in the civil rights movement, I mean, it wouldn't have happened without the church. You know, um, uh, Martin Luther King and many, many other ministers, you know, were central to, to the civil rights movement. And so it was only the continuity that B would be in the church, you know, um, and she would be spouting the gospel, and she was not suspect. You know, she was just someone that was a church lady, you know. So it partly was the, this, this recognizing the centrality of the church and, and, and the civil rights movement and the, the struggle against slavery. So that was, it was just a no-brainer, you know, to do that. Uh, and it is kind of satirical because <laughs> the church has its own contradictions, you know. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's not perfect. And when you really think about it, it's, it's, you have to see the humor in it, too. Thank you.
Well, Larry, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. And Larry will be with us again tomorrow night um, for a Q&A following uh, Cutting Horse. So please come back for that. It's a fantastic film. Um, and Larry, thank you again so much. Okay.